I think Turkey's liberals helped uh, Turkey's conservative Muslims to become a bit more open-minded on political issues over the years. Because when you go back to the 80s, from the conservative mind, Islamic mind, the view was that you know, there are pious Muslims and there are the others. The others are really who are not respecting our values and who have suppressed our values with things like the headscarf ban. Uh, but from the 80s, from late 80s onwards, and especially in the 90s, this intellectual co group called liberals in Turkey, they emerged as a protector of religious freedom, along with other freedoms. In other words, they emerged as the protector of the right to wear a headscarf, along with the you know, right to be Kurdish, along with the right to be Armenian, along with the right to be something else. And I think, thanks to their interaction with the liberal camp, uh, the Islamic camp started to realize that democracy is something that they can also benefit from. That modernity is something that they can be in. Because in the past, it was this dichotomy. I mean, this, there is either an Islamic golden age or there's this uh, godless, Western-imposed moder modernity which really suppresses your religion of, in various ways. So I think liberals have shown that there is a new paradigm. There is another paradigm in the West, a more liberal democratic West, which is actually respectful to religion, I mean, uh, if the religion is not oppressive. Uh, and that was added to you know, the exposure of uh, Turkey's Muslims, thanks to free market economy, uh, their integration with the world. I mean, they open up, they've traveled to the West more. They saw that you know, girls with headscarves can go to Western universities, although they cannot go to Turkish universities. Uh, the, that's why I think, that's one reason why the AKP and the AKP's, the people, the Justice and Development Party and the, and the cadre that formed the AKP, including Tayyip Erdogan, Abdullah Gül, Bülent Arınç, all the big names in Turkish politics right now, uh, they realize that the troubles that they have at home with, with regards to religious freedom is not because of democracy, but because of the lack of democracy. So that's why I think they turned their face towards Europe and they decided to join the European Union and, you know, and, and, uh, and accelerate the European Union accession process. W whether the European Union is welcoming or not, that's another discussion. And I think the fact that it is sometimes not that welcoming disappointed the conservatives a little bit. Uh, and then the whole society, I should say. But I think there was a paradigm shift there in the conservative mind. Instead of seeking a Islamic State, they said, we can be well off under a liberal democratic state. Uh, and who are, who are the people who are you know, pushing for this change? Well, there are communities and there are individual actors. First of all, there are many reformist, modernist theologians in Turkey. These are the people who look at Islam, who criticize some elements within Islamic tradition, such as misogyny. Uh, we have now Islamic feminists in Turkey who wear the headscarf, who are pious ladies but who speak about male domination culture in classical Islam. And they say it's not because of the Quran, but it's because of the medieval male domination mindset that our religion was interpreted this way. So they're arguing for reinterpretation. In other words, they're not arguing for the abandonment of religion. They just want to understand it in a better way as they see it. Uh, there are, again, individual theologians in Ankara or in Istanbul universities who look at religious texts and write important books uh, which sponsor a more you know, individualistic culture in Islam. Uh, and there are of course, uh, there are pundits, there are in, uh, newspaper columnists uh, which are very important in Turkey. And uh, there are more conservative ones but also more open-minded ones. And some of them have emerged as the staunch defenders of democracy and democracy including Kurdish rights for example or the rights of the non-Muslims. For example, when in Turkey, people discuss whether the Halki Seminary of the Ecumenical Patriarchate should be reopened, and I think it should be reopened, certainly. Uh, those people who defend this right uh, is, are not necessarily secularists. Actually, the most secularists don't like the idea of having a religious school in Turkey of any sorts. Uh, but uh, people like Ali Bulaj, for example, who's actually very conservative in some other issues, and is a prominent Islamic columnist, he has defended the you know, reopening of the Halki Seminary or people like uh, Fethullah Gülen, the leader of this Turkey's most influential Islamic community. He supports you know, Christian freedom because he sees in, within a general paradigm of religious freedom. Uh, so sometimes Christians in Turkey can find better friends among Turkey's pious Muslims than, uh, than, than, uh, than seculars who, who are sometimes very nationalist on these issues.
I think people who speak about reform in Islam should see that there are two sides to this issue. First of all, there is the question of what rights in religious texts. Then there's the, the other issue is, what is the culture of the people who read these texts? And I think both are important, and sometimes even the second part is even more important. I mean, the, the, the culture of the society is also important, because uh, when people look at religious texts, they see different things. I mean, if they're angry with something, maybe they sometimes see a violent worse, which you know, compels them to wage, wage a violent act. Uh, if they are looking for peace, if they're looking for tolerance, they can see uh, texts uh, you know, which, which promote these things. Uh, and I think it should not be forgotten that, for example, the change within Christianity took place, not because only a Luther came up or Calvin came up and you know, questioned some doctrines, uh, and what they question is also questionable, but also because societies in Europe changed and they got lessons from you know, what happened from religious wars, uh, trade, you know, created a new bourgeois class which was more tolerant, which was more exposed to different cultures, which, which became more cosmopolitan, and which started to really look at religion from a more liberal perspective. So, texts are important, but also people are important. Uh, and I think in Turkey, there's a, f there's a very rapid change within people, uh, w within the people who will read those texts. And, re like, recently, I, there was an interesting column by a Turkish Islamic writer uh, and he was saying this a bit critically, and he, he said in one of his columns, now Turkish Muslims are speaking about Quran and freedom rather than Quran and obedience. Because Quran and obedience was the medieval idea. So if, if you have a social structure in which obedience and cohesion is very much valued, you look at your text from that perspective. If you, are, if you have become more liberal in the way you live, you look at your text from a different perspective. So I think that's the main dynamic of change in Turkey. For example, I mean, uh, shaking hands with the other se opposite sex, like, I mean, can a woman shake a man's hand? I mean, that's not an issue in the West, but that was an issue. That has been an issue uh, in this part of the world. And many pious Muslims would, you know, refrain from shaking hands uh, if, if he's a gentleman with a lady or if a lady with a gentleman. Uh, in places like Saudi Arabia, you cannot even get close, you know. That's, that's very extreme. Uh, but in Turkey, no physical touch. But now more and more Muslims do shake hands, uh, pious Muslims, and you can see a, 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 a girl, lady in a whale, a headscarf, and she can come and shake her hand. Uh, why change? What, what changed? Uh, what changed is the culture. It became normal. The more they get exposed, the more they see people who want to shake their hand, they hesitate, hesitate a few times, and at some point they say, maybe it's not a bad thing. And an Islamic scholar, uh, Hayrettin Karaman, wrote about this uh, about a year ago in his column. And he said, well, in the old times, it was not custom to touch somebody's hand. But now in the modern world, it's something normal. So it doesn't connote anything. It doesn't have any sexual connotation. So it's, it can be something which can be accepted. So he, as an Islamic scholar, also referred to the change within culture, which also can uh, force people to look at their texts and reinterpret it. For example, I mean, this phenomenon that ESI called, wisely called, in my view, is the Islamic Calvinists of Turkey, this new business class, entrepreneurial Muslim, pious Muslim class in Anatolia, in Istanbul, you know, in, in, in various parts of Turkey, but mainly centered in Anatolia because Anatolia is the, you know, pious heartland of Turkey. Now, these Muslims, they, of course, love and respect Prophet Muhammad, and they speak of Prophet Muhammad as a businessman. Now that's in interesting because um, there you can find people who, who will refer to Prophet Muhammad as a warrior. And you can find those people in the Gaza Strip, for example. And the fact that they're in the Gaza Strip and the fact that they are in a decades-long combat and clash with Israel, that context makes them uh, politically radical and when they look at religion, they want to find something, some theme, which will justify their anger and their militancy. Uh, so this means, in other words, that I mean, the problem in Palestine is not just about people are pious or not. The problem there is that there is a political problem there that we should solve. You know, it may be through a state solution or something. Uh, when we come to Turkey, 
you don't people speaking of Prophet Muhammad as a warrior. He, he fought wars with, you know, the, with the pagans of his time, but people focus on his business side because those people are in business. And when they look at Prophet Muhammad, they, care, they more, mostly focus on what he said about trade, what he said, said about peaceful interactions, what he said about the beauties of trade. And that's a different, that's a different way of looking at the Islamic tradition. Uh, that's one thing. The other thing is trade is actually very important because when you look at even medieval Islam, as I show in my book, Islam Without Extremes, A Muslim Case for Liberty, uh, there were different schools of thought. There were quite dogmatic ones, there were quite liberal ones. For example, some schools of thought defended reason and its role in understanding scripture, and others said, no, reason has no role. It will just literally obey and no, don't question anything. Uh, some schools of thought defended free will, others defended predestination. So there was, broadly speaking, a liberal trend in medieval Islam. And it is interesting that this medieval trend emerged in the cosmopolitan cities of Islam, like Baghdad, uh, like Cairo, but especially Iraq, uh, and partly in Syria, but not in Mecca or Medina, because Mecca and Medina, the heartland of Islam, but they were isolated from trade, and the people who lived there were not exposed to different cultures. But the people who were living in Baghdad and who were merchants themselves, they were traveling from Baghdad to to Iran, to, to old, old far, way to Far East, even Malaysia, you know, some Muslim merchants went there later, to Africa, and they were being exposed to different cultures, and when they were exposed, they were seeing the nuances and they were looking back, back at their religion from a more comparative, if you will, perspective. Uh, that's why, for example, the uh, Mutazilites, the Islamic school of thought in the, in the medieval times, uh, who developed a rationalistic theology, they were exposed to Greek philosophy, uh, because Greek philosophy was discussed in Baghdad. It was not discussed in, 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 uh, in Mecca uh, because Baghdad was a center of trade and thus center of culture. Uh, and they wanted to uh, understand Islam which will deal with the challenges of Greek philosophy and they developed a, a quite a rational philosophy and a liberal in many ways philosophy. Uh, and actually the people say, and I agree that, experts say and I agree that, the decline of medieval Islam and the decline of the openness of medieval Islam was mostly related with the decline of trade. As you know, trade shifted to oceans from the seas and first of all destroyed by the Mongol conquest and crusades. As, as trade stagnated, Muslim minds stagnated in the Middle East. Now in the, in the modern world, uh, I think in places like Turkey, Dubai, partly you know, Indonesia, in Malaysia, you see a Muslim business culture, uh, which is, thanks to, thanks to the dynamics of business itself, are being uh, opened up to the world and becoming more rationalistic in, in the way they look at things. And I think that influences their religious perceptions as well, and, and from a positive uh, perspective, if you look at, look at it as a liberal.